Welcome to The Early Advantage, where this week we're going to talk about trend following, something that if you've seen my wardrobe, you know I'm, I'm clearly not an expert in. I'm just, this shirt is actually not too bad, but some of the other stuff uh, less so. But in culture, at least in Western culture, we're taught that it's good to be a leader, pioneer a movement, invent some new thing. Or if you're doing growth investing, at least not value investing, but growth investing, you want to get in on the ground floor, the earliest you can possibly get in on the next Apple, the next Google, the next Microsoft, whatever. My guest today, Michael Covell, who's an author of multiple books on trend following and has a hugely popular trend following podcast with more than 10 million downloads, says there is an easier way to do it by, you guessed it, following the trend. Momentum does have some backing in academic research. In other words, things that go up tend to go up, just like Newton's laws of physics. Things that go down, same thing. So we'll hear from Michael about trend following, uh, who it's for, maybe who it's not for, uh, the principles of how it works in just a moment. And then Brian Christopher is following with a momentum-based Bloomberg screen this week as well. So stay tuned. When I was in my mid-30s, I, I took a push-up kind of boot camp calisthenics class just for fun with a friend. I noticed next door there was this raucous dance music, uh, dance exercise class going on. And all my life, I've been afraid of dancing, and I'm not very good at dancing. But I figured I need to get out of my comfort zone. I'm going to go try this thing, the thing that I'm most afraid of. And I went way in the back behind this big industrial-sized fan, and I realized I wasn't actually the worst person in the room. There were people worse than me. And I gradually, I got so into it, ended up starting a dance fitness business myself with one of the instructors. It's a long and weird story. And that is a very weird uh, connection to my interview today, but it is thematically apical because in the area of investing, I have always been a fundamental analyst at a hedge fund. Uh, when I ran a research department, it was always about fundamental investing, long, short. And today I'm trying to get out of my comfort zone a little bit. And maybe if you're like me, you can get out of yours a little bit as well. We have someone who is really a, a world round expert in trend following or momentum investing strategies, to use the academic term. His name is Michael Covell. I saw Michael speak in Las Vegas uh, four or five years ago and was impressed. Uh, and, and now he's on my own show today. Michael, besides having the trendfollowing.com website and the trend following podcast or trend following radio, which has, I think, 10 more than 10 million downloads. He's interviewed Nobel laureates. He's interviewed billionaires. He's really a who's who list of all many of the world's best investors and, and business people. He's also written several best selling books, including trend following, as you might expect, and The Complete Turtle Trader, among others. And he has directed a documentary film called Broke the New American Dream. This was uh, about 10 or 11 years ago. Uh, Michael, thank you very much for, for making the time to speak with us, speak with me today. Hey, thanks for having me on. So first question, and by the way, you're the kind of guy who makes me feel like I need to get up and move my butt and and <laughs> and and get more out of life. I'm really impressed with your your resume there. And and just for those who don't know, in the background is Ho Chi Minh City. Michael has lived in Vietnam for almost a decade, which which I think is pretty cool too. That's something that I don't think I would have the the temerity or the just uh, adventurousness to do. Uh, but coming back to investing, how did you get into how do you get into this field to begin with? Um, and a weird question, if not this field, what else might you have done in your life? This field, hmm. not sure what this field is exactly, but like most people, when I heard about investing, I heard about Warren Buffett. I heard about Seth Klarman, margin of safety, fundamental analysis. But once I got into that, and I was a little late, my mid-20s, I was like, well, hold on. I, I don't have the academic chops for this. I don't, I've not been trained to study balance sheets and to look at all of this data and information, this nonstop flow of information. And right in the middle of that process of realizing that this was not going to be me, I heard about something called trend following. And I heard about this story of this famous trader in Chicago who had taken kids off the street, literally kids, some teenagers early 20s, and he was a trend-following trader, and he had this set of rules, a set of rules that you could use to trade currencies or inter interest rates or commodities, energies. didn't make a difference. Same set of rules. 
and no fundamental analysis. And I thought, well, this is really interesting. What's this trend tracking or this trend following system? And this was this famous turtle trading story, which a lot of people have heard of. And that just inspired me to go down the rabbit hole. And I, then I started to realize, well, hold on. There's this whole interesting group of people that have figured out that fundamental analysis is not so specific. And it's not so great when we have the 73, 74 bear market or the 87 stock crash or the dot-com implosion or the Great Recession or 2022. In fact, fundamental analysis starts to look like, excuse my French here, it starts to look like a sham, a scam even, when you have these market meltdowns because we're left at the mercy of who? We're left at the mercy of the Fed. However, if you come at the markets with a trend following perspective, you're not trying to predict what's going to happen next. You're just saying, hold on, the price is moving up. Okay, I'm long. The price is going down. Okay, I'm short. And applying this over a almost like a venture capital mindset to where you're looking for big unexpected trends but you're going to have a lot of small losses. It's, you know, for me, after all these years, it's not so controversial. But, you know, most people don't get exposed to this because if you you know this, if you go to school, uh, they hand you a bunch of a bunch of textbooks written by fine professors at the University of Chicago, and they all say that trend following is impossible, and they all say just copy Warren Buffett. And, and that's that's the world we live in. So I, 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 I'm, I'm a fan of this alternative thinking called trend following. So let me ask you a follow up then. And I, I wrote a small piece for for people who read my, my South Bank Investment Daily uh, uh, articles about the turtle trading. Um, and I mean, it seems almost too good to be true, like a fairy tale. This guy, Richard Dennis, uh, before he was 30 years old, he made uh, a several hundred million dollars, I believe, trading in Chicago. He came from humble beginnings. He borrowed money to to get, get a seat on the uh, the exchange, the futures exchange, I believe, and had to have his dad help him. And he had very little, sort of like 400 bucks, if, if, if what I'm reading is accurate. I mean, it seems almost implausible. And then he brought in uh, two groups of, of people, uh, even some, some females, which were rare in the, in the trading floor at the time. And they made, I mean, not everybody succeeded, but like collectively, they, they made like a hundred and something, they turned like $20 million into a hundred and something million dollars, uh, which again, just sounds like too good to be true. Now, this was 1983, if I'm not mistaken. Um, cool. My question is, A, it sounds like the story is legit. Uh, I mean, it's well, all the over the story, the story. The story has never stopped. That's the one mm -hmm. thing we, we got to be clear about. Trend following has never stopped. Even if we got rid of the famous turtle trading story, there are so many numbers of world-class trend-following traders unaffiliated with each other that have performed decade after decade after decade. And to come back on the challenge to you, uh, maybe too good to be true, maybe if I was to say from March of 09 until the pandemic, and maybe even this year, 2022, with 0% rates in bubbles in everything under the sun, I don't know. We we probably have to have debates about all kinds of things that are too good to be true. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you look, I mean, there's a debate even among the turtle, you know, aficionados or the 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 sort of the fans. Saying, you know, would this method work today? And we've oh, got very of course, different. Of course, it does. Of course. In fact, of anyone that does. anyone that says the trend following doesn't work today doesn't know what they're talking about. Literally, and it. And, and are probably only taking the opposite side of a book, whatever strategy they're promoting or talking about, quite simple. I mean, look, even the trend following performance for 2022 is insane, insane. Uh, so yeah, I just, not, not, to, not to push back on you too hard because I want you to push on me too, but yes, I, there's, there's, there's not any controversy. The data is freely available for everyone to look at.
pu- pushing creates diamonds. It's all good. Um, I guess what I'm wondering, what I was wondering about is compared to, you know, almost 40 years ago, uh, we've got much faster computers. We've just got more people and more quant funds. I mean, there's a lot more money in the market, a lot more uh, aggressive uh, modeling. I mean, the idea of, a, of something that could be taught in two weeks uh, outperforming so well. I mean, these days it would seem like a computer would pick up on that pretty quickly and and that would be uh, traded away. Uh, you're saying it's not, or I mean, it doesn't have to be the exact. Well, this, isn't, this, isn't, this isn't high frequency trading. This is not day trading. So compute, what, what does a computer do with a weekly bar trading system? See, the, you know, human nature still plays a role here. And human nature says, whether it's JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs or Jim Simons, hey, if we've got enough capital and we've got enough bandwidth close to the exchanges, we're going to play the high frequency trading game all day long. Well, that's not trend following. I mean, trend following is in, in many ways the opposite of Warren Buffett, but it's very stable. It doesn't, it's, it's not something that's competing with high frequency trading. So uh, the computers have, you know, computers can only do as good as their masters. And if their masters don't want to trade weekly bars, if their masters are not trying to find trends that might come from nowhere and go on for six months, then the computer might not do such a good job of picking that up. And in the short term, I mean, just to take your side of the discussion, not that it's even a debate, um, in the short term, psychology plays a much bigger role. In the longer, long, long, long term, I mean, you can't have a business, for example, that's making no earnings forever and adding no economic value to the world forever, right? But that business for a while could still go up if the belief that it is going to go up prevails, right? And look at GameStop. Look at GameStop, for example. GameStop is is represented in the media as a, a triumph of the little guy investor banding together. That's true. That happened in the beginning. But after just a few days, the the retail traders no longer dominated the trading volume in GameStop. Even during that short squeeze, the institutions fairly quickly picked up on what was going on and they moved in and they started dominating the trading. So in other words, retail investors lit the match and institutions picked up on it. And you had a trend that went up and went down. Now, this is probably greatly concatenated compared to the types of trend trends you follow. But my point is, whether it's right or wrong, whether it's logical or not, it happened. Um, is it safe to say that that your trends are longer term, but but sort of like you don't need to question it. You don't need to understand the fundamentals. You just need to see, look, there's a sort of a group psychology movement in effect in something, and it's time to participate. Is that the idea? Well, GameStop's a great example because GameStop's just this, you know, one outlier equity market. Whereas trend following is saying, let's follow the most liquid markets in the world that most every major institution is participating in. Interest rates, currencies, energies, metals, agriculturals, commodities. So I find something like GameStop is simply, you know, uh, a media creation, a uh, activist fund creation, um, some players with some inside information, a game to give the masses something to think about. Whereas something like trend following, a very stable, well thought out approach, again, it's traded over the most liquid markets in the world, uh, an approach that's been traded over these markets for decades upon decades upon decades. And again, as I said earlier, does extremely well when we have overall equity market meltdowns just a different headspace than than a, than a GameStop uh, scenario, in Got my it. opinion. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that certainly sounds attractive, doing extremely well during an overall meltdown. Um, maybe using a past example, uh, could you just walk us through, like, how how a trade might work? Like, you know, let's say you sit down and, and you're interested in, in using this system, like, what are some of the principles, like, what's what's maybe an example of, of this in, in action? Well, um, for example, this year alone, uh, interest rates interest rates have been the predominant uh, profit driver for trend following. So what's a, a simple way, without even naming a market, a simple way to think about trend following, 
let's say you've got a group of markets that you're tracking. And again, I've mentioned all the highly liquid ones. And you're following these markets. And you don't know at the beginning of a year, you can't predict what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen. I mean, for example, there's a, a friend of mine, and an associate who runs a fund. His fund has been up, I think it's up 80% right now on the year. Now, did he know when 2022 started that that was going to happen? Of course not. He didn't know that all these markets were going to start to move. So, but if you're in a flat position, if you don't have a position, with trend following, you're waiting for some type of momentum signal. So let's say the market is going flat for six months, whatever market it is, it could be a int particular interest rate, but then it breaks out, it moves to the upside or downside. You take a position. Now, do you know anything's gonna happen next? No. Now what do you do? Now you're just waiting. You're just waiting to see what happens. Well, that doesn't sound like much control over the market. Exactly. No control over the market. It's completely saying, I'm at the mercy of the market. Let's see what happens next. Now, you take that position with a stop in place. Two stops, actually. A stop to get you out if the, if the position goes against you, and a stop to get you out if that, stop, if that market goes for a long trend and eventually peaks and goes the other way. It's, it's not terribly complicated in many ways, but kind of as you've hinted about already, this goes against psychology. People don't want to, well, I'm not going to say people, some people don't want to trade like this. They would rather, you know, flip on Bloomberg, CNBC, listen to some guru, tell them what they think is going to happen. And, and that's, that's more exciting or more uh, fulfilling. But, you know, I look, at, I look at trading, it's kind of about five, five rules, really, whether you're a trend-following trader or a fundamental trader. What markets are you going to track? Are you going to track everything? Are you going to track a basket? When are you going to enter? When are you going to exit with a loss? When are you going to exit with a gain? And how much are you going to bet? How much are you going to bet on each trade? And I, I think if you're contrasting and just being intellectually uh, curious here, if we're contrasting between trend following and fundamental analysis, those rules are easy to understand for trend following because it's based, it's the only variable we're looking at is the price movement. That's it. Whereas fundamental analysis is going to say, let's don't look at the price movement. Let's look at you know, 10 or 20 or 30 other pieces of fundamental information to then predict what the price is going to do. Whereas trend following is saying, I'm not predicting what the price is going to do. I'm just going to follow it. I mean, and in many ways, maybe this helps to clarify for the audience, in many ways, trend following is not in any way, shape or form, a traditional investing or trading strategy. You're literally just trading numbers. It doesn't make a difference what the name of the markets are. How do you differentiate then? And I think some people watching may wonder, um, a lot of what you're, you're saying, Michael, would apply or at least has been said by proponents of technical analysis overall, saying, look, I just need price as my variable. Um, this represents patterns in human psychology. And whether it's right or wrong, I'm not here to argue, but this is what, you know, this is how the technical analysts do it. Um, is trend following sort of a, a simple version of technical analysis, or is there a thematic difference that's greater than that? I wrote about this issue for the first time in my first edition of trend following. I would say there's, I would say there's two forms of technical analysis. There's a predictive form of technical analysis, and there's a reactive form of technical analysis. Predictive technical analysis would be the people that are talking about the patterns they see in the squiggly lines, about the candlesticks and the dojis and this and that. And they write books with all of the so-called patterns that predict what's going to happen tomorrow. In my mind, that's no different than fundamental analysis. Whereas trend following is a form of technical analysis, but it's reactive. You're simply reacting to the price movement. It's a pretty, pretty strong distinction because, I mean, I've spent the better part of 20 years ripping to shreds traditional technical analysis. 
and anyone listening is welcome to hit me up on my challenge. But where are all the performance track records of the great predictive technical analysis traders? Where, where are these tracks? They don't exist. I mean, I've looked. I put, I mean, one of the things that got me inspired when I first broke into this field, so to speak, was the performance track records of trend following traders. It was so, it's such a great illustration of the success that you could find all these different traders from around the world and you could look at their month by month performance data and you could compare and contrast that. That was really interesting information. By comparison for predictive technical analysis, all the books that we can go find on Amazon right now today, I've never seen a professional track record that's extended for decades from any of that. It's all just book selling stuff. Interesting. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I share, I generally share your view of, of technical analysis. It sounds like for, we, we mentioned markets. You mentioned it doesn't really matter. I mean, the, the system could apply in many different markets. Um, it sounds like you would use this system, though, with with like a, if we're talking about equities, an, an index ETF or some kind of broad based thing to to minimize the idiosyncratic risk. Is is that accurate? Yeah, I think if you're some people say, well, you know, I only want to trade equities as a trend volume trader, then I might well say, OK, if you're going to track, let's say, 50 equities or 500 equities and you're going to wait for a momentum signal. Well, how do equities typically move? They, they typically move lockstep. So the trick with trend following trading is to try to find a group of markets that you're tracking. that's not so highly correlated. Because that's the real winner, winner, chicken dinner. That's the opportunity is to find markets that don't typically correlate together. And then that gives you the chance for these outsized moves that come out of nowhere that no one can predict. That's the fun part. That's the that is the alpha generation right there. Interesting. Uncorrelated then. Um one more thought. I'm trying to clear out any ammo I could possibly have against this just for, for, for sake of intellectual honesty. Um, in terms of fundamental analysis, an argument that I've often made is that it's good for humanity. It's good for an economy. It's good for, for sort of the corporate ecosystem to have people trying to actively discern, okay, this is a good business. I want to put capital into this. This is a bad business. I, I want to deprive it of my capital. Uh, and that sort of you know mechanism is healthy. And there's one reason I sometimes worry about index funds, passive indexing, because the criteria for getting investment if you're in a passive index is just being in the index. And and the the owner of the index at that point doesn't really care then if uh, you know how good the companies are. They're just buying the index. Um, with trend following in a world where everybody did trend following, uh, would would the overall market be significantly devalued because you just have a lot of volatility versus companies uh, or you know commodities, whatever it is being rewarded for underlying fundamentals. Like by nature, it's sort of an alternative strategy. It cannot exist as a mainstream strategy. Is that accurate? I think most people are suckers. Let's just be frank. Most people uh, trust what they hear on the TV. They trust what their neighbor says. They trust what their professor says. They give their money to some broker, some IRA or whatever, and they never ask a question. And they just go along with the show. They go along with the program. And that's it. And, you know, when you talk about something like humanity and the good and the bad, you know, we could go back and we could go look at the dot-com bubble. And we could say, how great was that, that we had all of this risk-taking to take advantage of the new internet. And then it blew up. I love the risk-taking. That was great. But when the dot-com bubble blew up, we then bailed out the risk-takers. We bailed them out in the form of the real estate bubble that burst in 07, 08, 09. And then what did we do after that? We then dropped rates to 0%. And we got perhaps the bubble that we're living through today. So if I was to contrast that with something like trend following, 
And many trend following traders are rooted in futures trading. Mm -hmm. They are speculators. Now, anyone that knows something about futures trading knows there's many different types of players in the futures markets. To have a market, you have to have different people with different motivations. You have hedgers, you have speculators. If a hedger could be Cargill or whatever, they've got a lot of strong economic reasons for why futures markets exist. And they are there to find a stable price for their product. But they need speculators to show up who are willing to come take the other side, so to speak. And you got to think when these big events happen, like this year, for example, when interest rates start to go wild, to think about all the major corporations around the world that have been paying the quote insurance premium, and then they have to reset. That has to go somewhere. Someone's winning in that zero sum game, and it's trend following traders. So I would argue that trend following is, is one of those great ideas in the sense that you need speculators in the game. Trend following traders are willing to be speculators. They don't always win, but over the long term, they sure as heck do really, really well. I hope I'm addressing your question. If you want to hit me back, if I missed a part of it, feel free. No, I, I think you are. I mean, I, I think I think it's accurate. I mean, no, I mean, it's it's hard for one single uh, group to be all the ecosystem. And and I think there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, to, to be clear. So, um, yeah, I mean, for every every hedger you need or not everyone, but you need a hedger to match a speculator, generally speaking, if, if they're taking opposite sides. And and we're talking, I mean, many of the people watching this uh, may be more familiar with, with equities markets, but in the futures markets, it's sort of like a stock option, but it's going to happen for sure. And you're either a hedger, uh, like you don't want to speculate on price movement, you want to factor it out, or you're someone who does, you know, so it's it's the balance of those two 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 things. So it, I think the the corollary in the equity market is it provides liquidity, basically. It provides liquidity, Absolutely. Um, which which can, can be useful. Um, all right. Is there anyone, uh, Michael, you think who who should not use this system? I mean, certain types of investing, we say, or at least if someone came to me to talk about equities, which is the area that I'm most familiar with, I would say, well, you know, Maybe you, you know, I don't know you, but somebody might be suitable for dividend stocks. Maybe someone else, you know, for biotech stocks. And this person should not do this because it's it's unsuited to their their way of doing things, their temperament, their demeanor, uh, risk tolerance, whatever it is. Like, who is trend following for, and and who is it not for, if anyone? It's an interesting question, and I brought something up a second ago that it reminds me of, and even and going back to the dot com bubble okay, right now we're all currently alive and we are living with the remnants of the dot-com bubble, the kicking the can down the road. So it's a very difficult question in the sense that whether I was talking to somebody who's 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 or 90, what's gonna happen, for example, if we see another S&P meltdown like we saw by the fall of 2002 or by March of 09, what's going to happen to the boomer generation if they're sitting there currently with pretty close to all-time highs of their equity market valuations? Now, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but I'm asking the if-then question I'm asking, I'm putting it out there to think about it. Can you imagine if the NASDAQ went down 77% from where it is today? Because in the fall of 2002, the NASDAQ was down 77%. So now I have to ask Mr. and Mrs. Baby Boomer, can you imagine going down 77%? Most people can't. Because we've had this crazy, unusual run of Fed intervention over the last 22 years that people want 
and this is kind of inherent in your question, they want something predictable. They want something consistent. They want something that's going to be easy, that's going to relax their mind and let them feel okay. But who, if they just at least pinch themselves right now, who feels okay with the current environment? I mean, who, look around the world. I mean, my gosh, China is so opaque right now. You mentioned how many times you've been there. I, I doubt right now you have a really good handle on what's going on there. I don't think anyone does. And then you look at the currency devaluation across the world. You look at the dollar strength. You look at the Fed chief saying, hey, you know, implying I'm going to be Paul Volcker all over again. And then back to my point, can you imagine 50% drops in stocks again for the boomer generation? It's a really interesting time in the sense that there is no one size fits all, but in some ways, everyone that's alive is in the same predicament, especially if they have money in the markets, they're in the same predicament because you're just trusting that these people that we see on the TV are going to fix it all, that they're going to solve it all. What if they can't? What if they don't? I mean, a lot of Americans, for example, probably don't think about Japanese equities. Why can't America go the route of Japanese equities down almost 50%, you know, 30 plus years later? Anything's possible. And again, I guess this is another reason why I like the trend following perspective, because anything is possible. And, and to also address your point a little bit more, can anyone do it? Maybe not. Maybe most people, even if they were to suffer a 50% or greater drawdown in their typical stock mutual fund, maybe that's the best they can do mentally, because maybe they've gone their whole life trusting the system and that's all they can do. Maybe they can't do more than that because it's just too stressful to think about. However, for those adventuresome sorts out there that say, you know, I really don't trust this system. I feel like I need something on my side to give me a chance to at least get some hedge to my uh, current market positions and life. Trend following is something interesting. It's a rabbit hole to go down, that's for sure. Interesting response. Yeah. I mean, I think the the normal portfolio guidance would be hopefully Mr. and Mrs. Baby Boomer wouldn't put all their money in the NASDAQ. They wouldn't go down, you know, 70 something percent and they would, you know, have a five year time horizon, at least for equity. So hopefully that bounces back up during that time. But, but, and, and by the way, historically, Big market crashes have been followed by by rebounds for the most part in the U.S. But you brought up a great point, Michael, which is it may not always happen. It, it didn't happen for Japan. I mean, Japan has been waiting for that rebound for uh, <clears throat> you know almost thirty years now, right? More than thirty years. How how and long it, did it, how long did it take for the Nasdaq to get back to um, its pre before dot com crash highs? It took a while. It's over a decade. Yeah. Yeah, it did. I mean, it, it, certain individual stocks recovered faster, but I think Nasdaq writ large took about a decade. Yeah. And there were some like Microsoft, there, there were many individual names too that did take also a decade they, to and, earn and, back. And to also, you bring up the idea of uh, the boomers and perhaps uh, Nasdaq markets, but what boomer out there now doesn't have a piece of Apple? I mean, the guys over in Omaha, the most famous fund fundamental guys have got Apple. So maybe and it's maybe, been one of their best investments, yeah. right? But I mean, okay, that that would yeah. be that's that would be a Nasdaq stock, right? Yeah, so true. So uh, if if one of these boomers or if one someone uh, World War II generation, anybody listening, says, "Wow, okay, this is cool," um, you know, I, I'd like to learn more. Uh, Michael, where would you recommend they start? Obviously, they can go to your website, trendfollowing.com, as one option. Uh, where else? The beast. There we go. The beast and the small beast. Yeah, awesome. yeah I'm, I'm easy to find. Uh, it's actually a good filter. If people can't find me, it's probably better that they don't find me. <laughs> <laughs> I think right? that makes sense. Yeah. Right. C-O-V-E-L, the name is easy enough to spell. So 
Cool. All right. Uh, well, if you're interested watching at home, uh, you know, please, please check out Michael's website or his books or his podcast. Uh, plenty of resources, as he mentioned. Uh, Michael Covell, thank you very much for joining us today or, or your nighttime in Vietnam. And thanks to you guys for watching at home. Hi there. I'm Brian Christopher. I'm the editor of Follow the Money here at South Bank Research. And in these videos, we take a theme and we run with it. We assess a theme that I believe can benefit given the current landscape. This doesn't always mean that the stocks profiled will rise immediately, but the stars are aligned on their side. That said, today's theme is imminent, and these stocks have already started rising. Today's theme is momentum. I have a proprietary market tracker that I use to assess the moves in the components of the S&P 500 index. I refer to this monitor regularly to assess what's happening in the market. This tracker primarily uses the RSI, or the Relative Strength Index, to assess the recent velocity in the moves of these stocks. The RSI measures the speed and magnitude of a stock's recent price action. It's a technical indicator. So it doesn't tell us what will happen to a stock a year from now. It uses data from the recent past to glean what we can at this moment. The trend is often your friend, so identifying it can help you earn short-term profits. When I ran the tracker on Monday the 29th, this was the sector strength breakdown. It may not surprise you that energy took the top spot. There will be volatility in this sector, and a pause or cessation of wartime activities in the, in the Ukraine will cause this momentum to subside. But as of now, there's no reason to fight this trend. Elon Musk isn't out to only benefit himself. As this article notes, he's a realist. Denying the importance of fossil fuels to today's society is a no-win agenda. The transition to green energy is an effort that many in the world embrace, but we won't get there without fossil fuels. So who will this benefit? Oil and gas companies are already benefiting. They already have momentum. A name in my Follow the Money newsletter is up 87% as I record this. And in my video in the Early Advantage that published on 20 July, I spoke about refining. All of those names are up double digits since then. This theme has legs and it's not going away soon. In a world that's short of commodities for its current and future needs, this is sensible. The article that quoted Musk also noted, quote, Europe's politicians have already earmarked about 280 billion euros to ease the pain of surging costs for businesses and consumers. And, quote, the EU will call an emergency meeting of energy ministers to discuss block-wide solutions, end quote. My question, why will they call it? Why didn't they call it weeks or months ago? This isn't that hard. Take a look at some of the oil and gas producers that have momentum and serve Europe. Shell PLC, ticker SHEL in London and SHELL in Amsterdam, produces oil and gas and refines it as well. And Europe needs them right now. VAR Energy, ticker VAR in Oslo, is an oil and gas producer. The charts of these two names have trended in like fashion since VAR started trading in February. It just went public, but it's been operating for more than 50 years in the Norwegian continental shelf. This iteration of the company was formed in 2018 when any Norge merged with Point Resources. Canadian listing that may not be obvious is Vermilion Energy, ticker VET in Canada. While Vermilion generates the largest portion of its revenue in Canada, it also has assets in the Netherlands, France, Ireland, and Germany. Its stock has moved much like that of Equinor, EQNR in Oslo, over the past two years. All four of these names are moving now. They have positive momentum. 
They all pay dividends as well. Vermilion's is the smallest, but all of the others yield at least 2%. I understand it may not be your cup of tea to buy something that has this kind of move already behind it, but that's what momentum investing is. It works until it doesn't. In a perfect world, we would trade closer to the start of the uptrend. And I need to be clear, if there is a recession, these names will take a breather. Manufacturing will slow and companies will require less raw materials for a time. You should then look for this particular uptrend to resume. The key in trading this way is to generate a price target and adhere to it. When you're starting out, you may just want a paper trade. Develop a plan, then create and track your trades on paper. When you start trading for real, you may have th second thoughts. In fact, you should. But if you create a plan and you adhere to it, it'll help you cope. Don't invest too much in each trade. And when you make money, you don't have to sell it all. Take some profits off the table, though. If you're really lucky, take all of your original investment off the table and play with house money. You must, and I mean must, establish prices at which you will sell. You must be willing to accept losses because you will have them. And remember, in addition to the charts that you've seen and the downright stupid energy prices you've been paying, another reason, another reason why this trade can work is the world is changing in front of our eyes. The world of the recent past, where production was limited to countries with a comparative advantage and we relied on just-in-time inventory systems, is fast becoming outdated. COVID and inefficient supply chains are forcing companies to store excess supplies or shut down. Some countries simply don't like each other as much as they once did. And if the carbon emissions goals of 2030 and beyond will become reality, the West has to find new sources of materials. We're behind, and I'm not sure how, how far behind our political leaders realize we are. We have to source fossil fuels to get where we want to go. Commodities are real, hold-in-your-hand assets, and the world needs them. This transition, the one broader than just energy, i.e. the reconfiguration of the globe, is big. It's real big and inflationary. But these are topics for another time. Thank you for watching.